Hello, everybody. Today, I chat with Anthea Roberts, who is a professor uh, in Australia who wrote this amazing book called Six Faces of Globalization. And Anthea is extremely aligned. She is extremely sharp. Um, she is thinking the the book is all about a pluralistic look at these different ways to view globalization. You know, from the left, from the right, from the establishment, from the from China. She's just all these different narratives. And I think that she is, she didn't really know that much about systems thinking until a couple years ago, but was just a supernatural systems thinker, always seeing the world from different lenses. And so we learned a lot about kind of how to view the world from different lenses in this episode. And we also learned a lot about like how to be a systems thinker at the end. And she's kind of how she's thinking about that and how to kind of uh, make yourself a more of a systems thinker. So I hope you enjoyed this episode with Anthea and uh, goodbye. Uh, it's going blah 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 hello my thing sounds good you want to say hey i'm anthea hi i'm anthea nice you sound great as well okay let's do it hello reese pieces i'm reese the co-founder of root and welcome to the reese show the century is a turning point in human history and i'm here to help you navigate it i hope you come away with a new understanding of the scientific technological and societal trends that are poised to radically reshape our world and how you can work with those trends to become a live player in building a solar punk future. And to chat about that, today I'm really excited to chat with Anthea Roberts. Anthea is a professor in the School of Regulation and Global Governance at the Australian National University, and she also co-wrote this amazing book, uh, The Six Faces of Globalization, that won a bunch of Best Books of 2021 awards. Anthea, thanks for being on the show and welcome. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, excited to dive in. And, and this book... So, so and to kind of frame it for you and for me and for the listeners, the goal for everybody here is to kind of understand and to put on these lenses of these six faces of globalization in your work, um, and then also to understand more generally um, how you think about kind of thinking in a multi-perspective and kind of systems thinking way. Uh, those are kind of like the two big things that we're going to focus on today. And so let's dive in on that first one. And I think just to kind of do the like uh, speed run of, of the book. Um, it's this amazing book, Six Faces of Globalization. And for the folks who are, um, you know, with this podcast in the past, they'll know that we chat a lot about kind of coherent pluralism, which I think you call um, synthesis. Uh, you call, you have a, a, another integrative complexity. That's what you call it, where you look at the complexity and then you kind of, okay, you look at the pluralism and then you kind of create coherence or synthesis or integrate all of it. And so this, it's an amazing book that looks from the frame of, um, you know, the establishment narrative, neoliberal, you know, win-win, rising tide versus these kind of other six frames of, you know, left populism, right populism, uh, anti kind of corporation power, and then like anti kind of China on the rise. And then finally, this like systems view of like, um, oh, no, the climate crisis is coming. So there's kind of like six different views on these six faces of globalization. And I think I want to, before talking about the book specifically, I guess I want to understand from you, Anthea, um, how did you kind of go about, and I know you were trying about how you didn't really, you weren't really a deep quote unquote systems, you didn't like, you weren't pilled into the SFI, um, like systems thinking world before this, but how did you come to write this book about these different multi-scale pluralistic viewpoints? Yeah, so it's a really interesting question. So you're absolutely right. I, I came to complexity theory and systems thinking very, very late in the book. In fact, I think after we had already submitted the first version of the book and while we were waiting for reviews on it, I sort of dove into the next round of my reading, which was on complexity and systems thinking and came to realize that a lot of what we had done really fitted with that. So you'll find a tiny bit of that, a few points in the book, which come from when I was doing the final round of revisions. But what's kind of most interesting about it is that many of the things that we intuitively did, I think, fit so well with complexity thinking and systems thinking without us having been aware of it. And I think if you trace that back, in fact, if you look at all of my projects, one thing that is quite clear across all of them is I tend to be drawn to very complex, contested and evolving fields. And rather than tending to have a desire to say this is right or this is wrong on a primary level, my instinct is almost always when there's that level of disagreement that there's probably something in two or more sides. And so I'm sort of interested in stepping up one level to try to understand, okay, what are the different groups seeing? What are they not seeing? What are they valuing? And why do they think each other is so wrong? And so I've done that across a number of different fields. And what happened in this particular case was 
you know, Nicholas and I both came up in international economic law. We were absolute students of the win-win establishment narrative about how economic globalization was great. And yet we really saw uh, contestation, particularly from around 2016 onward with um, Trump and with Brexit. And we noticed that many in our field were responding in a very, very defensive way of like, those people are stupid, like they're just protectionist, they're just racist. And our sense was that there was something deeper going on and that the first thing we needed to do was to listen and to understand. But once we started doing that, we started to disaggregate that there were multiple things going on and that the first way that we needed to move forward was not just to listen but to um, unpack the complexity to understand the different concerns and then exactly as you say, try to work out how to synthesise them back together, not to find one coherent answer but to find a sort of a mental framework or template for moving through the complexity. I love that. I think I think there's the two words there are um, stepping up a level, which is very, very helpful, aka going meta. The other one is like, you know, seeking first to understand, then to be understood, <laughs> where it's like, yes. okay, well, let's, like, let's try to understand first. Do you, and then for you as a person, I, I'm, I'm excited, I want to go deeper here, like double click. What was the catalyzing moment like in your childhood that kicked off this feedback loop that made you more like curious about multi-perspectivism or whatever? It's it's a really interesting question because I think there are some people who are very drawn to this and um, I think you can be drawn to this kind of way of thinking often if you cross different barriers. So if you cross national borders like you're a diplomatic kid, for example, you cross disciplinary borders, you're the child of divorce. So interestingly, I'm none of those things. <laughs> so it's not entirely clear. Um, but I, I think I'm somebody who I, I've been talking to people recently about the difference between sort of Putnam's concept of bonding social capital, where you very much pledge allegiance within a group and bridging social capital. And I guess I'm somebody that's always been an explorer. And so I've always been drawn to bridging forms of social capital, which is about listening and understanding. But I think I've also always been drawn to a sort of understanding complexity. And I don't have the same, I've, I've got a stronger normative sense of wanting to understand and hear people out than I do have as a dogmatic sense of this is right or this is wrong. Um, so I would say I'm not sure what the psychological basis of that is. I think one of the things that um, either manifested it early or else encouraged it early was that from a very young age, I was a debater. And in, mm. when you do debating, in one way you would think that makes you more dogmatic, but actually I think it has the opposite effect because it teaches you to argue any side and often to switch sides in what you argue. And so I think at quite an early stage from being 11 onwards, I got used to not necessarily arguing what I believed, but arguing different sides of things and, and having that kind of cognitive flexibility. And I think that kind of then coupled with more of a sort of a, a mediating type of mind because the kind of approach I do academically, I also do to my friends in their relationship troubles or to, you know, the workplace dispute. So I think it's, it's a similar kind of thing. And I, I see it with other people. There are some people who do it about national polarization, other people do, who do it about marriages. Um, so I think there's an instinct there, but my guess is that the debating probably helped prompt this as well. Yeah, that's great. That's interesting. I think, you know, I like the bonding versus bridging capital. I think that like one thing that like my org and we're, we don't necessarily the words for it, like whether it's being glue, whether it's being in network, whether it's like trying to be a bridge, it's like trying to do that often. Um, and then uh, and then the other thing that you said there is I think the debater thing makes sense to me. And I think it is I'm reminded of my um, my brother growing up. So I definitely have a lot of the tendencies that you have and my brother and my mom, but especially my, my brother was extremely stubborn. And so I had to kind of learn how to be a devil's advocate, essentially. And and I was just devil's advocate, which really annoyed him to death, but like devil's advocating all the time with like his stubbornness and like being kind of cognitively flexible was a thing that occurred a lot. So that that's an interesting kind of thread to, that maybe as we think about other random pluralist people in the world, um, what they might have. So I want to I wanna like dive back into um, the Six Faces book. And I think that there's... Oh man, I mean, it's such a brilliant book. Maybe the maybe the thing that I want to ask about it is, um, so you have this. Uh, this is actually not even in the book. Or let me ask the first part about the book. So the the synthesis piece. You do two amazing pieces of synthesis, which is there's one thing to say here. Hey, there's a left, there's a right, there's a you know an establishment, there's this like climate change narrative, there's the corporations, there's you know China rising. But then something that you do really, really well is you you, you synthesize them into these kind of arrows that show risingness and then also the kind of hockey sticks and crosses so do you want to kind of explain the hockey sticks and crosses and how you came to that synthesis 
Yeah, so this was very much with Nicholas. Um, so as a couple of different parts of the process, which is we were talking back and forth to try and disaggregate these different narratives, but we were also trying to work out how do you view, use visuals or metaphors to get across ideas in, intu in an intuitive way. And so when we started the process, we'd actually started separately. We were both had the establishment narrative and then I was particularly interested in the left and right wing populist narrative and I was then going on to the geoeconomic narrative. He had the establishment narrative and the um, right wing populist and the corporate power. So we we're working out sort of how to integrate them and what was similar and what was different. And as we started to do that, we did things like working out, well, one of our first conversations, I was like, oh, but, you know, you're focused on absolute gains and there's a different story if we tell relative gains so he went back and then drew it up one set of arrows in blue and one set red and we're starting to just go okay, okay are they disagreeing on ag um, absolute or are they disagreeing on relative and, and then are the relative gains are they sort of happening in a vertical way where you're sort of resentful towards the class above you or are they happening in a horizontal way where you're um, resentful of uh, other people in different countries and so we started to use that to organize our thinking and then actually as I was walking along the beach one day and we'd been wondering about what to do about the um, the climate change crisis because neither of us were environmental and we didn't really know quite where it fitted and it just suddenly occurred to me that this one was the mirror image of what we had seen so you'd had a win-win narrative on the top we'd been focusing on all these new win-lose narratives on a relative sense and it occurred to me that the climate crisis was going to be a lose-lose narrative. Um, and so that sort of created, in a way, almost a diamond shape for us of the different narratives and how to understand them. After we published the book, we had started to think about um, how we were seeing some images repeat in different ways. And we haven't published this yet, uh, but, but we've done it on a couple of talks, where we started to realize that the different narratives we had could be captured by what we think of as a game of hockey sticks and crosses. And so what we realized is that on our diamond, which had win-win establishment on the top and lose-lose um, sort of global threats on the bottom of climate change, that both of those actually were really well sort of picked up by a particular hockey stick that we saw. So the hockey stick we saw for economic globalization, the win-win narrative, was the hockey stick of um, economic growth, which has just absolutely gone up exponentially in the last couple of hundred years with sort of industrialization and trade and technology. And that's always the story that the economists tell about why this is so good. But we started to realize that that sort of matched a hockey stick on the bottom, uh, which was from the global threats narrative, which was the um, the hockey stick of uh, carbon emissions um, who, that have also gone completely out of control in this particular period. And we started to realize that they, uh, they were the, the same fundamental hockey stick, but one was showing growth and one was showing emissions. And what we realized about that was that that was utterly different to what we were seeing with the middle four narratives, these win-lose narratives, where we started to notice a pattern that the sort of figures we were seeing when we were looking at the material and those were not these hockey sticks, but were these crosses. And so if you took the left-wing populist narrative and the corporate power narrative, we thought kind of at essence, they're about concerns about inequality, kind of within countries usually. And there we often saw this cross where you would see something like, for example, what's the share of American income between the top 1% and the bottom 50% and the bottom 50% would be going down and the top 1% would be coming up. In a way that would create a cross and it really kind of made you think not about things being out of control like emissions but about changes in relative power and how that really affects people psychologically so we saw that on the left but interestingly we saw very much the same thing on the right with the win-lose narratives if you take the right to be the right-wing populist and the geoeconomic narrative, we saw similar crosses. But here, instead of it being kind of inequality within a state, it was often, for example, uh, the United States' share of the world economy going down and China's share of the world economy coming up. And again, it creates this cross mark. And it made us sort of think that there was this sort of pattern of hockey sticks and crosses that raises very different questions. Hockey sticks raise the question of what happens when things get out of control um, or you're, you're f solely focused on one thing that's sort of rising exponentially. Whereas crosses make you think much more about kind of changes in position and what that does to economic, social, psychological factors within societies and between societies. Yeah, I love it. I think that, so, I mean, popping off the stack there, one, I think that coming to visuals is such a crucial, crucial piece of the 
systems thinker mindset, which is like you can you can write things down, but it's like, okay, what is the core visual that you're trying to show to your viewer and I think or your reader or whatever? And then when you start to visualize things, yeah, it kind of it collapses it down into its like smallest um, you know, collapsible mimetic unit. And so I just think it's really a really powerful um play you know, like move in kind of design space the other thing that i and, and like the medium is the message essentially there the other thing that you're talking about that i think is really interesting and that i realize as you're talking about is that the um i'm not sure if you're aware of these worlds but like the top one of the progress that's also kind of like the optimists you know that's like stephen pinker yeah. etc it's also this world of progress studies which is all about how to make the exponential go even more exponential you know like oh how do we make sure the s curves don't s curve too much that like we really push progress um and then the bottom not only is it climate change but i'll send you this later but it's also there's other exponentials um like uh, artificial intelligence alignment and uh bio security and how like the cost to you know sequence and uh, sequence genomes and then finally um like nuclear security where it's like the uh, those are all exponential curves of just like yeah. creating things that could really thin us um so, so yeah, that is, that, on, that's interesting can i double yeah. click on that so two different things so the first is i think i'm generally interested now in power law curves and we see good power law curves and bad power law curves which have these exponential functions so the bad power law curves are often when you're looking at natural disasters or things that can that can really affect you in various ways but you also see power law curves in venture capital so that's your ai and sort of, sort of understanding how our societies work with power law but your other one about like reducing things to its essence with images i think the other thing to add there is that uh, that if you think about how a gardener's work about multiple intelligences how people have intelligence in different ways um you know musical intelligence linguistic intelligence one of the things that howard would say is that i'm very strongly a, a metaphorical and um visual thinker and so I, I'm very drawn to that as a medium for communication but also for developing ideas and it's so so I think and it and it really works for some people and it doesn't work for everybody so I remember um in one of my early assignments trying to kind of map out and draw a diagram or something and I would always try to explain it to the supervisor who would close his eyes to try to think through what I was saying I'm like no 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 don't, don't close your eyes like I'm drawing it right here. And it's a very good illustration. I, I think it's often something that really helps intuitively move audiences to understanding what you say, but it very much, the medium is not just the message. You also need to work out yeah. who you're speaking to and it works for some people and not for others. Yeah, I love that. That's funny. Yeah, for me, I'm like, oh, this is perfect. And for other people, it's like, what? Just like, what? Tell me what you're actually saying in words. Yeah. Um, I, a question I have for you is, you guys do a, you do a good job at the end of the book in talking about other possible lenses um, where you kind of just like flip the script on a bunch of the existing ones where you say, oh, like um, the other side of the establishment narrative is the neocolonial narrative. And the other side of the kind of, um, oh, no, China's rising narrative is, oh, yay, China and like Asia and and Africa and India are rising. That's great. Um, and so I think that there's so I think you do a good job of like painting some other ones that could fit onto that um, that like Rubik's Cube, those six uh, faces. But I have a question about, there's other groups that might go in there. And so I'm just curious, like the ones that come to my mind, maybe the biggest one is something like um, identity and and how something like, uh, like within America, you know, we have Me Too and we have Black Lives Matter and we have like social justice activism and like social justice doesn't really, doesn't like show up on the globalization of cube as much so how do you think about something like identity and how that might fit in as a as a perspective it's a really interesting question this is a question that we often get from americans and i think it's because the uh, social yes. identity questions are so front and center in the news and cultural debates in the u.s at the moment it, just as a point of reference it is not a question we ever get like in Europe or Australasia or China. So I think I think that's kind of interesting in and of itself. My own sense is that it's a very, very important debate what's happening in the US at the moment, but it's not one that features heavily in the globalization debate. So we we had been asked by Americans kind of what do you think of that? And, and our sense was that it was not a primary one that was speaking to globalization or being affected by globalization. But I would say one thing about those debates that I find really interesting is that the same technique we take about multi perspectivity and how you can have um, multiple sides of an issue. So some work by other people is very much about how we all have multiple identities. And I think that part of what's happening from my perspective, looking at the US at the moment is people are often becoming much more tribal about their multiple identities and they're sort of collapsing into more binary sort of identities in some ways, um, where, where sort of 
race and income and um, like where you live and everything are often starting to kind of line up in ways that are so stopping this uh, cross-cutting, bridging capital. And that maybe part of what we need to do is be working to um, mix some of that up a, a little bit more and to recognise that all of us have multiple identities and different ones can become salient at different points in time. That's a similar kind of complexity technique to what we're doing in the book, but just applied to something really different. I say that one of my one of my friends who I work with um, on complexity stuff, she does violence in places like Papua New Guinea, including um, against people who are accused of being uh, witches, and um, and then they're tortured. And one of the things they really actively do in their interventions is trying to um, understand how groups have multiple identities and overlapping identities and how can you make some of them become more salient so you find things in common and have other ones recede a bit when they're sort of antagonistic. So I would say it doesn't relate directly to globalization, but the tools and techniques may be cross applicable. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, it's it's kind of a classic. And sometimes with my kind of, uh, you know, I live in San Francisco, I got a bunch of, you know, lefty liberal friends, and I went to a liberal arts school and stuff. And so they're all kind of just, quote, unquote, pilled into this social justice world. And and but they don't talk that much about like the global south or whatever. And so it's like, it's kind of a, a funny a thing but the globalization perspective obviously is like no 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 we're not just thinking about america here people it's like it's not just 300 million it's we're talking about 8 billion and so kind of like trying to understand that lens i think um let me let me produce some other ones for and see how they might fit so one of them is like and i'm not sure if you're you're familiar with like i, I guess i guess there's there's maybe two frames here one of them is these like emerging meta groups um and i would call these things something like do you know effective altruism yeah you do yeah. Yep. Um, so, yep. so, so effective altruism um, is like one like increasingly powerful group. Um, there's this like there's like the techno utopians, which for me, I'm in tech. I'm a computer science guy, like the world of AI, the world of like Web3, like that feels like a, a thing that might be missing. There's also like maybe something I feel like you can uh, one thing that one of the pieces that we have written called this wisdom age piece um, makes some similar groupings as you all do. But at, it has kind of these macro groupings at the top, uh, which are similar to yours. And then the bottom, it has kind of like community organizing um, and then self transformation. And so like self transformation, I'm not sure how that necessarily plays into the, um, the, the, the big narrative. So how do you think about maybe effective altruism or techno utopianism or kind of self transformation, how those might play or not play into this kind of six places of globalization? So I've never, I've never thought about the effect of altruism or the, um, the personal transformation and how they would fit. And I don't have an immediate instinct to how they would fit. The techno utopianism, though, that's a really interesting one, because when you sort of said that the top of the cube, the win win narrative was sort of very optimistic, and the bottom was very pessimistic. One of the things that really struck me in doing the reading was the work, I think, is it by Charles Mann about the wizard and the prophet? Do you know? this one which is these two oh he, i don't know it deeply but I can't, what is that again yeah, yeah so he features i think i've got the right name but he features two different scientists <laughs> one represents um the wizard and one represents the prophet and these are these are real scientists and the wizard is that very techno utopian of like when we're dealing with running out of resources and everything what we need to do is double down on innovation and innovation will set us free and find the answer and it's sort of a kind of glorying kind of this development and this technological view. Whereas the profit is kind of like, oh, we're running out of resources. We need to kind of be abstemious. We need to cut back. And that's very much that more pessimistic, you know, there are, there are limits in our world and we need to respect them. And it's almost got slightly sort of religious kind of connotations to it of, you know, not wanting to um, sort of break the natural order of things. And I think that there's something very strongly at play there between the sort of optimistic and the sort of pessimistic and how do you kind of move between them. So I think his work would be really interesting in feeding into that. But the other thing I would say is that you said you're sort of in San Francisco and so you're very much clued into that social justice world. But I think the other thing that's quite interesting that we see kind of on the left is not just that social justice world, but really kind of a left approach that has assumed that the big Big bad guys are uh, the US government because it's been imperialistic and US corporations because they've been imperialistic. And I find that this group then sort of rails against big tech and everything, but their, their image is very much against kind of the metas of this world, the Facebooks, the, the US big tech. And there's this completely other technological ecosystem that's developing in China with their big tech who are also now starting to roam around the globe. And I find it's really hard to get 
these communities to talk. So they can be really, really concerned, for example, in the US about like there may be algorithmic bias that creates bad outcomes for, you know, African-Americans in, in, in America that really, really riled up about uh, those sorts of issues but won't talk about like Chinese companies going into Africa and using facial recognition to get data from various countries of um, people from Africa and sending them back to China. It, it's like these are ships passing in the night. And so I think one of, th there's like a technological optimism and a technological pessimism. But within the technology, there's also kind of like we're in a U.S. universe where we've got big, bad U.S. corporations that we need to fight against. And there's a world of like there are U.S. corporations in tech and Chinese corporations against tech and there are all these other players. And I feel like these communities just aren't connecting yet. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I think that there's a so I guess two parts of that one of them is well a on the conflict the um, wizard and the prophet and the kind of like optimist versus pessimist like uh, mindset I think that that's also uh, there's this thing conflict versus mistake theory and I think um, mistake people think that like the world is win-win that we can like make things better blah 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 and that there's just like oh we had some mistakes in government but like we can get better and conflict theory, theory says no we're like pitting one against the other like it's you know there's not there's not enough for everybody we got to kind of like make it happen and so i think that like yeah a lot of the techno utopian world is just about like hey we can just build our way out of any crisis you know <laughs> tech will fix it um and so that's interesting. And I think that the, yeah, I mean, the China one. So tell me more. I know that you were doing some work with the Chinese like foreign affairs office about these narratives and maybe some narratives within China. Tell us more about like, what have you learned from like internal Chinese narratives about globalization? Yeah. So I should say it's not the Chinese foreign affairs office. It's, um, it's China's equivalent of foreign affairs where we're about to, um, publish an article in it's called China International Strategic Review and it's run by China's top IR school uh, IR scholars when GC um, and it, it comes out of uh, Peking University and um, one of the things that we've tried to do is sort of understand how do the narratives that we talk about which are primarily narratives in the western debates how do they play in other parts of the world and what narratives might be different or missing and so we've presented our work in China um, on, on occasions and had multiple commentators from China. And so, uh, and, and I don't read Chinese, but I, I um, read a lot of English sources about Chinese and a lot of translations. And I, I work in the College of Asia and Pacific with a lot of China experts. Um, so I'm sort of a China conversant, even if not China fluent by any stretch. Um, and so what we've tried to do in this particular piece, which will come out soon, is we try to understand where is China in the Western narratives? And then where are the narratives? What are the narratives in China? And so on where is China in the Western narrative? A lot of people's instinct is China's always the bad guy, like China's the ones that's stealing the jobs or China's the one that's the technological rise. But actually China plays a really different role depending on the narrative. So with the win-win globalization one, China is actually the poster child of how we got this right and how hundreds of millions of people were brought out of poverty. Um, for those on the sort of uh, right wing side, China's often the bad guy that's stolen the jobs or kind of becoming the strategic competitor. But for those on the left wing or the corporate power one, there's often a sense that China's the scapegoat, that, you know, really the problems are domestic inequality ones and you're just trying to like shift the blame onto China um, without sort of like whether or not that's fair or not. And then in the sort of climate change, global threat space, there's the real sense of like whatever the problem is china is the indispensable nation we've got to work with them and so we've got to come to grips with all of these things so so china plays as a really interesting kind of foil in the in, and a different foil in the China, in the Western debates. But then in the Chinese debates, part of what's interesting is what's similar and what's different. So they have their own version of um, the win-win, which is sort of a win-win with Chinese characteristics, which is that China's rise is, is good for China and good for the world and that they will spread this um, prosperity through things like the Belt and Road Initiative, which, which is a very sort of positive narrative. We have a very negative narrative, which is sort of the counter to the and uh, the geoeconomic narrative, which is it's not that China is a threat; it's that the U.S. is a hegemon and that's trying to contain China's rise, and that that China and Russia need to struggle against that. And we also have increasingly what's happening in China is um, the, the sort of move towards common prosperity, which really has a lot in common with the corporate power narrative and the left wing narrative, which is it's not just about growth, it's also about equality and reigning in the power of big tech. But what we're really kind of totally missing, or not totally missing, but largely missing in the Chinese debate is the equivalent of the anti-colonial um, narrative that we have traditionally heard 
within the third world a sense that the developed nations have used economic globalization for their own benefit at the expense of developing nations. Whereas China has grown so much because of its export led economy that that kind of negative argument about globalization is just not a mainstream narrative in China, which is, I think, itself interesting. Well, interesting. So if I understand it correctly, well, A, one piece of that that's interesting is that you're saying uh, there's this thing called the victim triangle, which looks at mostly in relationships and how there's someone who's the victim. And so this would be China, where it's like, you know, from the establishment perspective, it's like, no, this was win-win, rise all tides, like 400 million people out of poverty. But then there's the, um, what do they call it? The perpetrator um, that says like, hey, or the persecutor who says, oh, wait, no, like, but the right saying, no, 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 you're you're bad, you know, whatever. But then the, the rescuer is kind of, it's not like the left is necessarily um, uh, rescuing China, but they're saying, oh, that's just a scapegoat. The, the problems are actually, you're pointing at the wrong person or whatever. Um, so that's interesting. And then I think on the, the China narratives, it sounds like, well, A, the common prosperity thing. Yeah, it's interesting. If you look at the different Chinese um, leaders and how they talk about, um, they're, they're very into memetics and they're very into like the, the industrialization piece, um, the, kind of like the bottom, like the base piece but also into the superstructure piece of like how to like how the ideas should change and so um the and as almost all of their ideas and i would and i could share these with you afterwards but there's kind of like if you look from deng xiaoping through xi jinping they all have this idea of try, like in like the classic deng xiaoping thing is some people need to get rich first or whatever yeah. and like and that's okay um but then they also have this there's this constant balance of like how do we make sure that like the, the gains are distributed so that everybody's kind of happy as it all yeah. goes uh, out? Um, but how do you, so the, the other one that you're talking about though, there's like the Chinese, like in the West, we are like, oh no, we were kind of a neo clone we were colonial, neo-colonial, we were bad. But in China, they're all just like, yo, this is amazing. Like, we're just doing great work. Is that kind of what, what you're saying? Yeah, so I, I think- I think they sort of don't feel that they've been ripped off in this past period of globalization yeah. and they haven't been ripped off in this past period of globalization. Mm -hmm. They really see this as this that through their own good management and through their own hard work. So I don't think it was just handed to them. They thought there was good management by the Communist Party and a lot of hard work by um, Chinese nationals. They've managed to sort of pull themselves out. But what's then interesting is I think in their lived experience, some have gone from kind of bicycles and really poor living conditions to these gleaming cities. It, it not only changes their psychology, I think, about their own country, but it changes their psychology when they go into other places. So there's really interesting evidence now about Chinese entrepreneurs going to really difficult places in Africa and sort of setting up shop, but with a real sort of mentality of like, like we can change this and like I can get rich, but you can kind of get rich too. And I think that's a really interesting different perspective that I think in the West we're often thinking at the moment, oh, like globalization's falling apart and everyone's against it. But if you actually go to popular opinion in other parts of the world, that's not necessarily what's happening. And certainly in Asia, I don't think there has been that impression. But I think there is a much stronger impression in China that um, the West is trying to contain China's rise and that China has been here before through the century of humiliation and does not want to be put here again. And I think it's really important to sort of um, understand that perspective and also understand the historical background and, and knowing as well that the Chinese Communist Party very strategically uses the century of humiliation, like teaches, like after after what happened um, in Tiananmen Square, they really ramped up the century of humiliation, sort of teaching and monuments and all that sort of stuff. So, but but it's one of those sort of ambiguous <clears throat> um, things that the century of humiliation happened, and we need to understand that. And the century of humiliation is also used as, as a tool for sort of um, encouraging certain ways of thinking. Yeah, I love I love the um, and even the term century of humiliation. Like what? <laughs> I mean, and I don't know what the the like. The, the Chinese, uh, I used to speak a little bit of Chinese, but yeah, I think um, I think the other thing that's interesting there is I think there's a, what makes me think of, you know, all the Gen Zs in America and that 70% of them think that the, I forget what it is, but they have like no hope for the world or whatever. It's like, oh no, like there's just like pure pessimism versus like optimism, which obviously optimism creates reality in some ways. It also makes me think of this great guy, Tamim Ansari, who wrote this book about macro narratives through big history. And, and one of them is this um, progress narrative um, is is that is that um, the West had a progress narrative, which is that the Black Death sucked. We, you know, like thirty percent of people got wiped out, and then coming out of that, I was like, 
oak and we were like in the west and europe was just kind of like a, a shithole essentially for that whole for the last like a thousand years while china and india were having golden ages and china india and the middle east um and so then there was like oh now we can actually do stuff we can do progress and then we did the you know all the mercantilism and the colonialism and industrialism and all that stuff it's like boom we did it all and and but what the what and, and Tamim is talking specifically about Middle Eastern narratives, and that's a restoration narrative. We need to get restored back to that amazing time that we had before. And I think that's a similar thing with China and whatever. So I want I want to ask a question about um, one other. You know, we got you know uh, roughly ten minutes left, and I can think one question I want to ask you, which is I think you, you all do a pretty good job at the beginning of the book of saying like what makes a narrative a narrative. But I want to kind of double click on that a second. I think there's like. You know, so so hmm, how would I say this? So yeah, the, the 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 background here is like I'm writing this book on what information wants, which is this big history about how these informational patterns emerge and genes created the tree of life, and then memes, ideas going from mind to mind, create the tree of ideas, and those ideas include ideas like communism or capitalism and nations and religions and all of the above. And so it's like these narratives really kind of take hold in various different ways. And so I'm curious, like, how you think about which narratives succeed in the kind of mimetic landscape and and kind of competition and cooperation of like how narratives succeed that's such an interesting um question and your book sounds fascinating by the way can i before i answer your question can i just complicate your narrative a little bit which is sure y- yeah. your um you're seeing like the the tree of ideas and the tree of narratives, which has a sort of a, a branching structure. And one of the things I think is super interesting now is the work about how it's not the tree of life, it's actually the coral of life and that we have reticulated evolution where things kind of go in one direction and then they, they don't just diverge, they also converge. And I think you could think about that a little bit with narratives as well, that they don't just diverge, but they converge at various points. So if you take, for example, the corporate power narrative, we actually had a corporate power narrative that was really there in like the battle for Seattle, like before um, before 9-11. And that was really sort of gaining hold and starting to challenge the orthodoxies of the win-win approach. But then kind of 9-11 happened and there was a huge shift in focus to terrorism and to the Middle East and Iran and Afghanistan. And that kind of took a lot of momentum away from that sort of corporate power narrative and redirected it towards some of the traditional national security narratives. And all the while that that is then happening over a couple of decades, you've got China steadily economically rising so that by the time it really does sort of have 2008 and you get like an economic shock uh, in the West and you sort of realise that China has really risen, then suddenly there's this sort of swivel back to a, sort of a new set of narratives where the great threat is not a terrorism, but it's the, the rise of China. And so I think it's, a, it's interesting to kind of watch over time which ones sort of rise and fall and, and how they happen and how we create different blind spots. I'm not sure how I would say exactly like what makes different ones take hold, but I think one of the things that we've really noticed in it is that when people want to contest narratives, they often want to contest on the facts. And there are often things in narratives that are right and that that are wrong and there are factual questions that you can check but there's often also a a very strong kind of sense of value judgment about what's important and who's right and who's wrong or what's what's um what we should value and you can't you can't rebut those by looking just at facts. So when you look at the different narratives, almost all of them do actually have some factual basis to them. So there are facts that they can point to in support of their argument and they sort of tune out facts that are less supportive of them and then they can also make incorrect statements. But a lot of what's going on in the narrative is that it's articulating kind of an emotional need or a set of value judgments. And, And that seems to be what really picks up speed it's also what if people don't hear that emotional need i think it it really creates the hostile response so i think you see this the most with the right wing populist one where the right wing populist one is really trying to articulate a sense of communities having been left behind people not being valued all of the problems that come from that that are not solved simply by saying, well, look, our TVs are cheaper and our imports are cheaper. And the economists want to say, look, you're you're stupid. You don't understand like the economics of free trade. Of course, we're better off. But also you're racist or politician. You're stupid because politicians that are racist are using this to hoodwink you. Um, And there may be some of that stuff going on, but there is also a very strong kind of emotional lived experience about the 
the devastating effect that some of this has had on particular communities and the importance that they place on things like community, uh, traditional values, being able to stay in the places that they have grown up, that I think the establishment narrative isn't hearing. So I don't know if that quite answers your question, but there seems to be a very strong emotional current here. Yeah, cool. That's interesting. I mean, I think, well, A, totally agree tree of life versus coral of life. I think what I'm giving like the, A, I've never heard coral of life, but that's great. I'll probably use it in the book. So thank you for that. Um, and very into, there's a, um, oh, what's that person's name? Deleuze uh, has a, uh, is all about the metaphysics of blah, blah, blah. And it's the move from from trees to um, bottom-up networks and stuff like that. And so it's like a similar-ish uh, claim um, from categories to, like bottom-upness. I think that the, um, uh, yeah, and that we should see these I, tree of ideas or tree of life or whatever as like, more of a this convergent evolution where it's more a question of what puzzles exist rather than what the answers to those puzzles are. Uh, I, another way to say it is like, you know, flying is a thing and then there's just a bunch of, or it's like the air is a thing and then the the universe was saying, the earth was saying, hey, is there anything that can like evolve to fit into and to become a flying thing? And then bats existed and birds existed and a bunch of different, you know, you know flying squirrels existed. And so a bunch of things were like, oh, I can like get energy up there. Uh, and so I think similarly, you can have a similar kind of framing on, um, on ideas that it's like really about the puzzles and like what can exist in the mind. And I think and going to your point here, I think that there's a... Um, yeah, I think that, you know, the facts for me, and I think I really like it in Niall's in book that there's a, you show these amazing graphs that just show the like underlying truth behind where the emotions are coming from, which is like, where you're like, look, the right wing populist folks, like, you know, it used to be, you know, the amount of people who have died of these, um, of drug overdose and this thing, it's gone up like more than 2x in the last like, you know, 10 or 20 years. It's like, that's tough. That's like a, and that's just like the tip of the iceberg. So that means there's so much more loneliness and blah, blah, blah happening that isn't like, oh yeah, you got a cheaper TV, but mostly what it's doing is just addicting you more to Netflix or whatever. Um, and so I think that the facts are important. I think the values, yeah, the values and the emotions piece, I just think, oh, I guess what I would say here is I, I want there to be a... <laughs> kind of like a, a more of a theory of memetics here and more of a theory of these narratives and how they kind of how they propagate in in, in our worlds and our networks and how and i agree with you that the the kind of hate you know jonathan hate righteous mind moral foundations are really important and then just the pure like emotions are also really important but how they kind of interlock mm. and relate to the logic um as a facts seems like a very important thing um to me and i think the so people I wanna, who I wanna, are I studying ask, social media the people who are studying social media, I think, are, are really sort of focused in on that. And I guess that would also go back to what we talked about of bonding capital and bridging capital, that much of our social media and, and TV networks are really encouraging our bonding social capital, which polarizes these narratives much more. And what would what would our social media environment be like if it actually privileged not extreme views, but if it privileged integrative complexity, how different our ecosystem would look? It would be so much better. So, <laughs> and I totally agree with your your pointing at those folks. What do you think? Um, a question here about systems thinking. What advice? I know that you kind of came to, but yeah, you've been a system. I just want to read here when I was looking at your Google Scholar. Your in two thousand one, you had a piece that was called uh, "Traditional and Modern Approaches to Customary International Law: Colon a Reconciliation." And so you're kind of reconciling a bunch of different viewpoints. So yeah, you've been you've been doing this for a long time. Do you have any recommendations for listeners who are trying to? And they might be in law, they might be in academia, they might be somewhere in the world, and they're trying to kind of do multi-perspective systems thinking -y stuff. How do you, do you have any recommendations for the listener for how to be good at that or whatever? So the multi-perspective one, I've started to think about how to teach this to students because we often don't do anything like this. And I think one of the ways that I would start is with a, a book called Images of... Um, Images of Organizations. It's by um, Morgan. Cool. And they take one thing, which is the corporation, and they have like six or eight different ways of understanding it as like a, a mind, as a, corp as, a, as a machine, as kind of a, a political institution, these different metaphors, which is very, very much sort of what we're also doing with economic globalization. But what it's teaching you is that each of those metaphors kind of reveals and obscures. And I think... At base, eight metaphors can be too much for people. It can be too much complexity to handle. But I think one of the ways that you can do it is to just in a very simple way, get people to think about problems and think, okay, 
what are the different metaphors I could use to help explain this problem? And what are they revealing and what are they obscuring? What analogies could I use? And in particular, some metaphors tend to be mechanical and some metaphors tend to be organic. Um, so some are about sort of you know, tuning something up and kind of getting everything to work together and some are about like, you know, your ecosystem and your growing in the garden. So when I think about governance issues now, I try to encourage people to think about what are some multiple metaphors and what do we get out of them, but particularly how does a mechanical metaphor apply here and how does an organic metaphor apply here and how does it make you see the situation differently? And I, th I think a lot of the yeah, systems thinking, like – is about moving organic. off into the organic metaphors, right? Um, yes. um, and so. and so I think actually t getting people to to apply those two and to realize how incredibly different their approach is to to that is a, is an intuitive way to get them to move in these directions. Yeah, I like that. I think that's interesting. I think yeah, it's kind of like showing them the two framings, but then also kind of nudging them towards a more organic framing. Uh, there's this great piece called Metaphors to Live By, Metaphors yes. to Believe By, uh, okay. by um, this guy, Aaron Lewis. And it's a really great piece about Moloch and these other, these big narratives that are kind of like metaphors that are shaping us. And then the other one is, um, yeah, the organic metaphor that's part of this, sp you know, this spiral dynamics thing and thinking about how we view ourselves, what's the, what's the main metaphor for ourselves and like tr trying to view ourselves, the networked human organism as an organism is is, is a, a helpful reframe. Um, and I, think, well, I want to ask one. Hey. I was going to say on your spiral one. So one of the things I think is interesting there is like, what is our metaphor for understanding time? And often in Western culture, we have a very linear kind of the arrow of time that moves sort of in one direction. And then in many sort of, Asian cultures, there's much more of the the circle of time, like, you know, things repeat over time. And one of the things I'm interested in is like the spiral of time, which is somewhere in between the arrow of time and the circle of time, because we repeat, but we don't fully repeat. And it's kind of a rhyme. And so what, do, what, what is our conception of time if we think about it through a line, through a circle and through a spiral? That's amazing. I mean, I think, yeah, and that kind of gets back to the coral of life and that there's convergent evolution towards like certain world states. Um, so that that makes a lot of sense. Okay, as a final question here, um, uh, I'm going to ask you some underrated, overrated. And so I'm oh. going to say some things and then you're going to tell me um, you're whether Tyler you'll give Cohen. me like the 15 second version. I say the, exactly. Oh, yes, yes, Tyler Cohen. Um, so the first one is, um, do you think that the role of the internet in globalization is overrated or underrated? Can I explain my answer or do I just have to say overrated? Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. You can, you can explain it. Yep. But you're trying to explain it in like a paragraph, not uh, five minutes yet. Yeah. I think historically it's been overrated because people thought it would bring everyone together. I think at the moment it is underrated because we're not looking enough at how the fragmentation, not just into China and the West, but also into things like the Russian net might actually fragment our international understanding of the internet and therefore fragment um, our intellectual ecosystems and media ecosystems. Interesting. So there's like sub fragmentation within countries and then there's also aka more bonding and capital instead of bridging. And then there's also macro fragmentation of these different internets. Um, cool. What about uh, the role of China in globalization? Oh, I mean, gosh, it, it is so enormous. I don't think it's overestimated. Um, I don't, you know, it's just, it's enormous and it's going to continue to be enormous no matter what happens. I think, I think there's been an underestimation of the importance of Asia. Um, and Asia is much broader, obviously, than China. Uh, so I don't know exactly what happens with China, but I think, I think, yeah, not underestimated. Beautiful, beautiful. That's great. Yeah, I mean, I think it is amazing. You just look at the number. It's like 8 billion people in the world, 1 billion in North and South America, 1 billion in Europe, 1 billion in Africa, and then 5 billion in Asia. And so it's like a billion plus in India, a billion plus like one point, you know, in China. And that's just a lot of people and they're all rising. And then so it's like this century is going to be all about China stuff and, and India stuff, and the next century or the, the big transition. And then, but then we get 3 billion more people in the next century and they're all in Africa. And so it's exactly. like Africa is going to be killing it in 2200. And so that, or 2100, you know, um, so that's, this has been great. Um, Anthea, thank you for, for your time. I think if anybody's interested in the book, I mean, it is a great, 
If you're interested in learning about multi-perspectivism, um, or if you're interested in how to kind of view the global stage in a non kind of just dogmatic way, I super, super recommend the book. It's uh, got a lot of great graphs and a lot of, uh, it's just well-written. So definitely check that out. Also check out um, Anthea on the Twitters. Um, it's Anthea E. Roberts. So that's A-N-T-H-E-A. E, I guess your middle name starts with E, um, and then Roberts, R-O-B-E-R-T-S. Uh, Anthea, do you have anything else that you would like to uh, tell our listeners today? No, I just this sounds great. And uh, listening to you, I just want to get a reading list from you because you've got so many interesting kind of points of view and, and different ideas you're tapping into. So I love that. And please send me a list of reading recommendations at the end of this. I think we'll. I think both you and I are going to be very aligned on that. And I guess, yeah. I mean, I'm excited to look at this um, images of organization one. And I think, yeah, I think we're just uh, we're seeing the world in similar ways. And we hope that there will be a lot more people who are doing integrative complexity um, in the next 25 years. So uh, towards that future. Well, thank you so much, Anthea, and thank you for listening, everybody. Goodbye. Thanks so much for listening today. If you like the show please give us a five-star podcast review or subscribe on YouTube. And if you'd like to chat about this episode with a community of amazing, smart, ambitious, divergent people, come on by and join our Discord. You can find it at root.co. That's R-O-O-T-E dot co. And then finally, if you'd like to contribute to these ideas being shared more widely in society, you can support the podcast production team at patreon.com slash Lindmark. That's patreon.com slash R-H-Y-S-L-I-N-D-M-A-R-K. Thanks and see you here for the next episode. Bye.